We have a Bible. Go ahead, open it to Acts chapter 8, verse 26, as we look at this tremendous story of evangelism. All right, now when I say evangelism, some of us have a variety of reactions, right? How many of you get super excited about evangelism, right? How many of you, when I say the word evangelism, get a little nervous because now you know me after a while and you're like, he's going to make us do something, all right? We get a little nervous, right? And some of us are, are natural uh, evangelists, or another way of putting it, natural conversationalists, right? So if you have someone in your life that they make friends with everybody they meet, and then there's people like me, <laughs> I ain't talking to you, all right? So some of, we have varying personalities, right? My mother-in-law will become every human being's best friend that she ever meets until Jesus calls her home. It's a wonderful gift. I've witnessed it, and I just stand there amazed because I'm like, I don't, I don't want to make new friends. I have a good amount of friends, and that's good enough for me. Does anybody else feel like I feel, right? You're like, you know, this is, this is a good, big enough circle of people to know, right? So when we talk about evangelism, Sometimes some of us are just naturally gifted and born for it, and it's, it's our gift. And then other times we're terrified and we're like, I'm not John the Baptist. Please don't make me go out there like Paul the Apostle and do these things, right? And so we get nervous. And what I want to do this morning is, is help remove some of the fear that comes with evangelism. Because as we're in the middle of a sermon series, I'm calling the, the heart of the church as we're looking at what does it mean to be followers of Jesus? What does Jesus through his word actually command and call us to do? One of the things that we're called to do in the Great Commission is to make disciples. And we do that by teaching or telling people about who? Jesus. That's called evangelism. All right, so none of us can weasel out of it because Jesus is the one telling us to do it. So what I want to do this morning, though, is kind of remove some of the fears or the trepidation that, that we sometimes carry in our hearts when it comes to the idea of, oh, my goodness, am I really, am I really the person that's supposed to do this? Because I'm not gifted in that or I'm not trained or I don't feel equipped or whatever reason you come up with, right? We fill in the blanks very quickly. And so as we look at this story of Philip, it's an amazing story, right? Now, there is a lot of miraculous things happening in this story. An angel speaks to Philip, then the Holy Spirit points out a human being for him, right? Like, imagine if God did that for you, if you're like, I'm just going to the restaurant, and then all of a sudden God's like, but that's the person I want you to go talk to. Now, some of us are like, boy, I wish God would speak to me. However, <laughs> if that happened to you in that moment, you'd be like, I'm good with him not talking right now, right? Because then, then you have no excuse, right? So there's a lot of miracles. And then at the end of this story, the Holy Spirit miraculously transports Philip to a completely different town and region. So on the surface, we can look at this story and go, Oh, okay, good. I don't have to do any of it because <laughs> I'm not Philip. Angels aren't talking to me. The Holy Spirit's not transporting me all over the place. But I want us to look at this story from another perspective to see how we can actually learn to be like Philip, to share the good news with the people in our lives. So the first thing that I want you to know about Philip is this. He's not an apostle. All right? Philip is not an apostle. He's not, you know, a, what we would call like a pastor. In fact, the first time we meet Philip is back in Acts chapter 6. And he's one of the men chosen to take care of the tables and feed bread to the widows. That's his job in the church. So if you were just looking at whose job that you know, descriptions that you would pick for who's going to be the evangelist, who are going to be the, the people that go out into the world that God uses to share the gospel, Philip probably wouldn't have been on the list because everybody would have been looking at who? The apostles. Been like, well, that's going to be Peter and John and, all, and Paul and all these other guys. That, I mean, Philip's just over here waiting on tables and serving bread. He's not like the apostles. And yet what Jesus does with Philip is Jesus guides Philip 
into places and where people are that he can have conversations with them about who Jesus is. So in verse 26 says, Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go south on the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he got up and went there. He met an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasury. All right, so an angel might not speak to you. I'm just going to bet on that, okay? Or that it hasn't happened recently. But as we've been praying as a church, as we've been going through scripture together as a church, one of the things that we do know is that we've committed to together is praying for people in our lives to know Jesus, right? So an angel might not come down from heaven and speak to you and say, this is exactly where I want you to go. But the Lord has put people in your lives that he wants you to go to. He has put people in your lives that you love, that you care about, that need to know about who Jesus is. And so one of the things that we learn from Philip is simple obedience. Right, sometimes we don't do evangelism because we're we're just disobedient sinners. I know that's not the nice thing, like the nice way of saying it is, I'm nervous, I'm afraid, I'm scared, I'm untrained, I'm I'm not an apostle, whatever else. But the reality of it is, sometimes we don't do it simply because we're just being disobedient. I know that's mean, (laughs) but at least I know it's true for myself. And you're like, well, I'll just be like Philip and wait for an angel of the Lord to tell me. Yeah, I mean, that's another excuse you could come up with. But I know that there are people on your heart and people in your lives that you care about deeply, that you love, that you want them to know about Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is commanding us through God's word and guiding us through God's word to be like Philip and to be obedient to that call and say, I am going to pray for them. I am going to invite them. I am going to share the gospel with them. Now, the other thing about this story that I love is that it shows us that God actually gives us opportunities to share the gospel, right? Whose plan was it for Philip to go there? God, yeah, that was not a trick question, okay? Philip didn't get up one day and go, I'm gonna go find an Ethiopian eunuch. I'm just going to walk around until I find one to talk about Jesus with. No, it was God's plan, right? So when we pray, when we ask God to guide us, God is faithful to give us opportunities, whether we like it or not. <laughs> it's a dangerous prayer. Lord, you know, Lord, you guide me. Lord, Lord, you be in charge of my conversations. Lord, you be in charge of my relationships. Right? It sounds wonderful, but sometimes it's scary because sometimes he's going to tell you to go, okay, I want you to go to this other place and I want you to meet this person and I want you to talk to... And you're going to be thinking, why do I have to go there? <laughs> why do I have to go talk to them? Right? But what we see is that it is part of God's design and plan to give his people, to give you and me, opportunities to share the gospel. So the story continues that... The Ethiopian eunuch had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, sitting in his chariot, reading the prophet Isaiah, which is very convenient for Philip, right? Then the spirit said to Philip, so again, who's leading, who's guiding? God, right? The Holy Spirit is leading and guiding his people. He will give you opportunities to share the gospel if you ask him. It says to Philip, Go over and join his chariot. Now, I just want you to think about how awkward that is. So if you're like me and you're kind of a a little bit more naturally reserved in meeting strangers, (laughs) picture it this way. Someone is sitting in their car in the parking lot and God's like, I want you to go knock on the window and invite yourself in to the car. How many of you are like, sure, Lord. No problem. All right, now that's way too extreme. You can think about what if someone was just sitting at a table at a coffee shop or at a booth in a restaurant 
And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit was like, that's the one. Just go sit down with them. Now, I've actually had the Holy Spirit do that to me where my friends and I were the ones sitting down and a stranger came up to us and started asking us about Jesus. And none of us were like, what is going on here? Imagine that, though. Like, put yourself in Philip's place. You're like, yeah, I know. It would be really nice if the Lord just pointed somebody out for me, right? I've seen that as an excuse before. (laughs) And the Lord's like, oh, okay. Why don't you just walk up to this stranger's chariot and get in it with him and start talking? Never mind, Lord. Don't point anybody out to me. Right? This is what happens. So, again, we see that the Holy Spirit, every step of the way, is doing what? Is guiding Philip. Is pointing him in the right direction. Philip doesn't have to come up with a plan or make it up. He just has to trust the Holy Spirit's guiding. All right, so verse 30. So Philip ran up to it. Now, that's a word of excitement, right? How many of you would just sprint over there versus like stand there and ponder for a little while if you really did indeed hear the word of the Lord and then maybe you're taking baby steps. Maybe if I walk slow enough, they'll drive off. Oh, no, I missed my chance. What I love is the example of Philip's obedience. The Holy Spirit said something, guided him, And Philip's response is, okay, if that's where the Holy Spirit, if that's where God is leading me, if that's the person God is guiding me to, then I'm going to run over there. I'm not going to waste time. I'm not going to hesitate. I'm going to obey. And so Philip runs over there, heard the man reading the prophet Isaiah, and he asked him, do you understand what you are reading? Now, this is an important part of the story. So I grew up in the South. Sometimes it's referred to as the Bible Belt. And we did all kinds of weird evangelism stuff in the Bible Belt, okay? Sometimes it worked, most of the time not. Now I'm not going to make y'all do any of that, all right? But one of the things that we would do I remember being in youth groups or with other church groups, and we would have a whole stack of Bibles. And then they would assign us to go into, like, parking lots and stuff and find chariots, (laughs) find cars, find people, and just walk up to them and start handing out Bibles. Or sometimes we would hand out booklets or tracts, okay? Now... You guys know me, right? I'm all about God's word, sharing God's word. That's a horrible form of evangelism because here's why. Philip is asking the guy, you're reading the Bible. Do you actually understand what you're reading? And here is his answer. How in the world can I understand unless someone guides me right we're not just like walk around find strangers and then like throw a bible at them be like it's all in there because how are they going to understand it now i've seen this play out in our first call out of seminary my wife and i planted a house church for uh, college students and people in their 20s that had given up on church. And we had plenty of people coming that, when I would say open a Bible, because I've been doing that for a while, to Romans or Matthew, half the room would look at me and go, where is that? See, we forget because you're like, okay, yeah, sure, it's in the bulletin, or okay, I, I I can find it, all right? Or like, oh, this story is amazing, or this passage is beautiful. But for the person who doesn't know Jesus, who's not familiar with God's word, it doesn't make any sense to them. They don't know where it is. So Jesus is calling you and me, when it comes to sharing the good news, to do more than just you know, toss a Bible at somebody, be like, good luck, I hope you figure it out. 
or to, or to toss a track at it. What he's calling us to do is what Philip is called to do here, which is guide them, right? Which takes a conversation. It takes building up a relationship and speaking with them and getting to know them, right? It's not this drive-by evangelism where like, well, we gave you this information. Is the information good? Yeah, sharing a Bible with them, good. But what's better is actually speaking with them about Jesus and guiding them. The way I sometimes put it for Christians is this. If someone handed you a Quran, which is the book of Muslims, and you just started flipping it open, how familiar would it sound to you? Or how familiar would it read to you, right? You'd be like a little bit lost. For people who didn't grow up in church or they they don't know who Jesus is, they're not familiar with God's word, that's the equivalency for them. You're handing them a book and they don't know where to start. They don't know where to begin because they need somebody, they need you and me to guide them through God's word to Jesus. Right, so how in the world can I unless someone guides me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And then the passage that they're reading is, is from Isaiah, and it's about Jesus. And of course, we read it and go, oh, obviously that's about Jesus. He's the lamb that's slaughtered, and it, you know, it's all the story of Good Friday and all this wonderful stuff. But then in verse 34, the eunuch said to Philip, right? And this is my point. It looks obvious. You read it and you're like, that, that's obviously about Jesus, right? Because who's the whole Bible about? Jesus. All right. Verse 34, but the eunuch said to Philip, please tell me, who is the prophet saying this about, himself or someone else? What the, what the man is asking Philip is what you and I take as a passage of scripture that is so crystal clear about Jesus is a simple question. Who is this about? He's reading God's word. He's reading a passage that is very clearly, if you know the Bible, about Jesus. And yet, what is his question? Who is it about? And so Philip's responsibility is not to be like, well, just keep reading, you'll get there. Just keep turning the pages to the right, eventually you'll get there. What is Philip's responsibility? What is his job? What has the Holy Spirit led him there to do? Guide the man to who? Jesus. All right, so in verse 35, Philip started speaking and beginning with this scripture, proclaimed the good news about Jesus to him. Now, here's what I love. Before you uh, try to make an excuse, like we're all good at making excuses, right? Everybody's got one. Before you go, well, you know, I don't really know the Old Testament that well. Don't, I know you're thinking it. Stop it. All right, before you come up with that excuse, here's what I want to point out about what Philip does. It says, Philip started with that passage. Why did he start with that passage? Because that's what the guy was reading. Another way I want you to think about it is, Philip starts the conversation where the eunuch is. Right? When it comes to us sharing the gospel, we want to start the conversation with where the person is. If they've got a Bible and they're asking you questions about it, guess what? Yeah, start there. If they don't know who Jesus is at all, guess what? Start there. We want to start where their questions are. We wanna start where they are at in their journey of following Jesus. Right, so yeah, sometimes they might have a Bible question for you. Sometimes they might be reading Isaiah, and that's really convenient. And other times they might be reading something else or have a question about something else. And so what I love about this example from Philip is it's this reminder that, no, we wanna start wherever that person that we're talking to is at, all right? So here's the next thing he does. He proclaimed what? The good news about Jesus to him. So 
to make it really awkward for y'all. We, I am gonna make you do something today. You're welcome, aren't you so glad you came? All right, <laughs> some of you are not saying yes. All right, <clears throat> so we're gonna do a very, very simple exercise that we used to do with our daycare kids. So if they can do it, I believe in you, all right? So find somebody in the church right now. Find a partner, find a buddy, grab somebody, okay? That's point number three of the sermon. (laughs) I'm not pretending. You gotta move around if you gotta move around. Find one or two people. Make a friend, all right? If you don't know their name, start there. (laughs) All right. Does everybody have a moving buddy? Hey, I'm the one with the microphone. Back to me. All right. So, Philip shares the good news of Jesus. So here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna take turns sharing the good news of Jesus with somebody. Because we're gonna practice it here so you can get all of your feeling weird and awkward about it out of you. So when you get out there, you can at least say, I've done it before, all right? So if you need help, here is a good summary. Jesus loves you, Jesus forgives you, Jesus died and rose for you so you could have eternal life with him. Now go and practice for a few moments. All right, I hate to interrupt all these wonderful conversations. All right, so. How did it feel to tell someone that Jesus loves them? It feels good, right? It feels a little weird, but like, okay, yeah, we do it. Now, this is one of the things that God has called us to do. It, it, it is assumed in the New Testament that this would just be the natural conversation of the church. That wherever the Holy Spirit guides us, wherever he leads us, whoever he leads us to have a conversation with, that as followers of Jesus, we would be able to and willing to share the gospel with them. Now, in Romans chapter 10, it says that Paul writes, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved, right? We know that. We're like, yes, that's, this is gospel. You, whoever you are, whatever your background is, no matter what sins you've committed, no matter how terrible you feel about yourself, that God loves you so much that if you call in the name of Jesus, he loves you, he forgives you, and he gives you eternal life. Then Paul asks some rhetorical questions, right? Everybody remember from childhood where the rhetorical question is? You're not supposed to answer it, it's just making a point. So we get that, we're like, yes, Lord, that's so beautiful, isn't it? And anybody who calls on Jesus is saved. Then Paul follows it up and says, how are they to call on the one they have not believed in? And how are they to believe in one they have not heard of? And how are they to hear without someone speaking to them? And how are they to speak unless they are sent? So you and I, as followers of Jesus, as believers in Jesus, are the ones who are sent. It's not just the apostles, right? It's not just all the wonderful examples we see in scripture. It is everybody who believes in Jesus is a sent one. One of my favorite theologians, a man named Alan Hirsch, and he said, there is no such thing as an unsent Christian. Every single one of us are called by Jesus to the Great Commission. One of the things I love about this story of Philip is he's not an apostle. He's not an ordained pastor. He was someone who was helping and serving in the behind the scenes of the church and the everyday mercy ministries of the church. And then the Holy Spirit was like, why don't you go talk to that person though? Why don't you go share the gospel with that person? And then as the, the story ends, 
Yes, I know it's miraculous and the, the Holy Spirit takes them away and then sends them to a new place and that's probably not going to happen to you and I. But in verse 40, Philip, however, found himself at Azotos and as he passed through the area, meaning as he's just going about his business, as he's walking through the town, going to his next place, he proclaimed the good news to all the town. What we see is that for Philip, it was, a, it was a natural, wherever I'm going, the good news goes with me. Wherever I'm sent, wherever the Holy Spirit leads, I bring the gospel. And the reason I share the part from Romans chapter 10 is, yeah, we, we love that good news. Whoever calls on Jesus is going to get saved. But we also have to remember the fact that when Paul starts asking all those questions, the answer is, they're not going to believe in Jesus. They're not going to call on his name unless they hear his name and know who he is in order to believe in him. Right? That's the whole point of rhetorical questions. Everybody understands what Paul's saying? Like, this is true. Anybody who calls on Jesus is going to be saved. It's God's grace. But what Paul also says is true is that, but if they never hear his name, nobody ever tells them about who Jesus is, they're never going to call on his name and be saved. And then he asked the, the big question for you and I is, who's going to speak? It's the ones who are sent. And who are the ones that are sent? You can say us. So, whew, we just practiced, right? It's us. So here's uh, one practical application. All right, so on your way out today, and I'm going to be standing there watching, so, you know, feel a little guilty if you have to. I don't care. Um, there's these little booklets. It's called a Three Circles Conversation Guide. This is a, a simple tool that I found very helpful, and I've, I've shared it with a few members, and I had positive feedback, so I'm going to share it with all of you. All right, and I want every single person to pick one up, and if you could pick up more than one to share with friends, that's great. And what it is is it's a guide to help equip you and to make you feel more confident in a simple way of how do I talk about God and Jesus and the gospel with people who may not have a background in faith or may not know much about the Bible or who Jesus is. And the reason I'm being so adamant about this is because in Ephesians 4, the Apostle Paul says the job of a pastor is to equip the saints to do the ministry. So it's my job to help train you and equip you, that we do this together. All right, so on your way out, you can pick one of these up. We'll be handing them out. If we run out, I will order more. And it's a very simple solution. Also on the welcome table out in the narthex, there are also resources from Lutheran Hour Ministries that are free for you to pick up. And if we run out of those, guess what I'm gonna do? I'll order more. But they answer questions about who is Jesus? What does it mean to believe in Jesus? Why did Jesus die? So if you want to be equipped of how do I answer these questions in a simple way, Lutheran Hour Ministries has great things there. There's also a, a handout from Lutheran Hour Ministries for children to be able to answer those questions too. So it's for all ages that we are all learning how to share the gospel because we all agree that we believe what Romans 10 says, right? Whoever calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. But we also have to believe and be obedient to the part where Paul says, but how are they going to believe unless they hear the name of Jesus? And someone's got to go tell them the name of Jesus. And guess who that is? It's us. All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that whoever calls on your name, no matter our background, no matter our sins, our brokenness, will be saved by your great grace and mercy, that through your cross, your death and resurrection, we have forgiveness and eternal life. Holy Spirit, guide us to those conversations, guide us to those people in our lives that you would have us share the gospel with. And like Philip, make us obedient to your guidance and will, so that more and more people will hear the name of Jesus, call on his name, and be saved. In your name we pray. Amen.